Amen. But until then, oh, my heart will go on singing. Right. Until then, with joy I'll carry on. Until the day my eyes behold the city. Until the day God calls me home. One day, we're going to glory. We are. That doesn't thrill anybody else. Well, it thrills me. I do not like aches and pains. And uh, I have some. And they say, well, you're too young to have aches and pains. I live too rough not to. That's right. And uh, I wished, I wished, 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 however it is. <laughs> Amen. I wished I did, but I didn't. We are looking in the book of Isaiah, chapter uh, 43. And I, I want to look at this thought, God's purpose for his people. God's purpose for his people. And I will look in verse number 10 uh, where we will find our portion of scripture. We will also look at a couple other places. We'll look at verses 7 and verse number 10, both of those. Read in verse number 7. Everyone, even, even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory, I have formed him, yea, I have made him. And then verse number 10. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. Our Father, thank you for the word of God that it is a lamp on our feet and a light on our path. Lord, we look away unto thee and long after thee and ask you, God, to help our hearts on to thee. Lord, would you uh, consume our mind with Christ? Lord, I pray, dear God, that we would not be carried about with any other thoughts, but the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart might be accepted in thy sight. And Lord, that every word we speak might be a word in season for them that are weary. Lord, that the Spirit might convince of sin and of righteousness and of judgment for those who are struggling with uh, sin. But Lord, for those who are struggling with situations, dear God, that you've girded them with strength and make their way perfect. Oh God, help our hearts and our minds. Help our lives for Jesus' sake. Amen and amen. So as we look at the scripture in Isaiah 43, uh, we find God. You know, they're God's elect people. Israel, my elect, my chosen. They're God's elect people. And let me say, he's dealing with uh, Judah and Jerusalem. That is God's elite people. And we've been over this before, how they, there was a split in the kingdoms. And remember that only two tribes went to the southern kingdom, uh, Judah and Benjamin. The rest of them followed the other king. They followed the rightful king, even though he was doing wrong. He had a wrong attitude, but he was a rightful king. They didn't like how he did it, but he was the rightful king. The others followed a servant who was wanting to be a sovereign and became a sovereign. And guess what happened? God did not make him to be a sovereign. He made himself to be a sovereign. And many said, oh, I like him. Why? Because he's going to do what we want him to do. Right. And I, I'm not going to preach on how we do that in America, how we get the wrong people because we don't like the right ones. That's right. Because we want them to do what we want them to do. Not what's best, but what we want them to do. So we look at them, they're God's elect, they're God's elite, but they're God's erring people. We know this. He says, he, he, he talks about it, we found that in chapter 1, as they were sliding backwards, they were going their own way. When God had a, a called them out to be his people, and yet what did they do? Oh, they went about doing their own thing. All sinful nation of people laid with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They have gone away backward. You find that somebody says, I don't believe in backsliding. They have gone away backward. That's what backsliding is. They're going the wrong way. Yep. On the right path. What about that? They got on the narrow way, but they're going the wrong way on the narrow way. They said, we're going back. I, did, they not, did they not tell Moses when they came out of uh, Egypt? Let, we want to go back to Egypt. Yep. 
We want to go back to Egypt. We're going the right way or the right path, but we just want to go the wrong way or the right path. We want to go back to what we had before. Can I say they're God's erring people? And can I say God's going to judge them for their sinfulness? He's dealing with them about to go into captivity. Right. They're going into captivity. Before, so He brought them into captivity so He could bring them out of better people. A blessed people. Because let me say, God's law is going to be honorable. Yep. And so Israel becomes a people that are robbed and spoiled. And there's no possible way of escape from this. And God must judge His people. If He's going to judge the world, He must judge His people first. Judgment must begin at the house of God. If God does not bring judgment upon us for our sinfulness, how is it going to be that He brings judgment upon the world right. for their wickedness? That's right. We just... I mean, escape by the skin of our teeth. Pretty much so. So all that being said, God has a purpose for His people. God's purpose for His people, she's supposed to be a missionary people. A missionary people. To bring life unto the Gentiles. Matter of fact, chapter 42, I have called thee, in verse number 6, I have called thee in righteousness and will hold, my, hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant for, of the people, for a light to the Gentiles. He tells us again in chapter 49 and verse number 6, he's made them a light to the Gentiles. You know that this was the case. Matter of fact, is that not what he called them out for in the first place in Ur of the Chaldees when uh, he calls out uh, Abraham from Ur of the Chaldees? Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, to, uh, out of thy father's house, unto the land I will show thee, and I will make thee a great nation, I will bless thee. And make thee thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. That's right. God made his people to be a blessing. And let me say, God's desire for his churches is to be a blessing. That's right. That's our whole responsibility. And I, I say this a blessing to God by the grace of God, but a blessing to all that we come in contact with. That's right. Let me say, he called her out to be a to to be a light of the Gentiles, and, and Israel did that by the mind grace of God. He overrules in what happens in their lives. Why? Because he has a plan and a purpose for Israel, for Judah. And you know what happened? Oh, hallelujah! The Lord Jesus Christ came along, a light of the Gentiles. How did he come? Because God rules and overrules in the affairs of men. God rules and overrules in his people. That's right. Oh, he brought them into captivity so he could bring them out of better people. That's right. A blessed people. And a blessed people. It's so true for Israel. It's so true for our church. Let me say, the church, and I use that word. In general, we're talking about all those that have been born again and baptized by one spirit into one body, placed into Christ. And I'm talking about the local assembly. God has made us to be a blessing. God has a purpose, and He's going to accomplish it. That's right. I noticed this in some things in chapter 43 before I get even into the message, really. Uh, some thoughts here that God uses two names. For here in verse number one. But now saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, for he had, uh, and he that formed thee, O Israel. He talks about Jacob as an individual. And then he talks about Israel as a nation. And can I say, God has a purpose for you as an individual, but he also has a purpose for us collectively as a body, right? And that's the way God operates. God uses Jacob dealing with the individual, Israel dealing with the nation. And you'll notice in verse number 10, our, our portion of Scripture, ye are my witnesses, individual, and my servant. That's right. That's a singular word, not servants. And there's some 
thing that we can learn about this. Because God uses each part of the body, each part of the body in a particular way. A particular way. Matter of fact, he tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, as the body is one and many members, and all members of that body being many are one body, so is Christ. And uh, God has got a place for you in the body. Is it a place of honor? Or is it a place of dishonor? Now you can be a best of honor, honor sanctified and meet for the master of use. God wants you to be. But there's in a great house there are vessels also to under dishonor. You say, well, what does that mean? Those that don't have such an honorable position. But if you're going to be a vessel of honor, you better be sanctified and meet for the master's use. You want to be more than just a, and, and I'm, I'm for toilet cleaners. Let me say this. Somebody has to clean the toilet. That, that, it's true. That's true, yes. All right. And is the toilet a vessel of honor or the toilet a vessel of dishonor? Yeah. You tell me. All right. Important. Well, what can I say? Some have, somebody has to do it. But if you want to be more than that in the house of God, and I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than go to the tents of wickedness. That's right. I mean, I'd just rather hold the door for people. That's right. Just be the lowest li little usher who right. washes the servant, who washes the feet of those who come in the door. Right. Than not do anything. Preach it. But if you want to be more than that, then it's going to take you being sanctified and meet for the master's use. That's right. Put off the things of the world and put on righteousness. Amen. Put on purity. But God uses each part of the body to act in a specific performance. For what? To profit with all. That He can do the job that the body is supposed to do as all. I mean, can I say Ephesians chapter 4 teaches us that Christ is the head from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies according to the effectual work in every measure or every part, making the increase of the body and edifying of itself in love. God uses each of us with a purpose. And it profits every one of us. He has one that can play the piano has one that can lead singing, one that can teach, one that... I, well, Miss Melissa, I guess you can, but uh, preach. She can put an outline together, okay. One that can put an outline together. And somebody else gets up here and just tries to talk and tries to preach. That's right. Right. God puts one for one thing and one for another. Everybody's got a part that's the problem with all. Yes. The right. whole body is fitly joined together. That's right. And if, we, if, if it's all done, then guess what happens? We accomplish what God has for us to accomplish. Because every joint supplies things. Now, what's a joint supply? Who knows what a joint supplies? Uh, mobility. Movement. Yes, sir. Mobility. What kind of movement does it normally supply? Forward. They were going way backwards. God said, I put you in here to go forward. That's right. The normal way a body operates it is not natural to walk backwards because God did not put eyes in the back of your head. Right? God had it set up to where you go forward and He put the body together to make it go forward. Yes. But these ones had gone away backwards and they did not even see where they were going. But God says, I'm bringing you into this place so I can bring you out so that you can accomplish all of my will. God has a place for every individual to operate in the whole. He says, ye are my witnesses, say the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen. So I want to look at three purposes. I'm not going to look at all three of them. I'm going to look at one of them this morning and hit on another one. He said, the three truths that God's purpose that we find in uh, Isaiah 43, verse number 10, and in verse number 7. We find God has a purpose in His people. God has a purpose with His people. And God has a purpose by His people. That's right. God has a purpose for His people. And we want to look at God's purpose in His people this morning. Here He tells us 
that you may know and believe me and understand that I am He. God's purpose in His people is that you'll find three things that He has purpose in His people. He has an imperative purpose in His people. He has an important purpose in His people. And He has an intimate purpose in His people. Now God gave them to us in the other order that you may know and believe me. Know me, believe me, and understand that I am Him. He deals with the intimate first, because that's the closest thing to Him. Then He deals with the important, believing Him, and then He deals with the imperative. Understand that I am He. Can I say, understand that I am He, that, that imperative, first of all, is all about our hope. There is no hope if you don't get that one settled. That's right. You must understand that He is He. Right. Before him there was no God for him, neither shall there be after him. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Amen. He wants you to understand that he's it. If you do not understand this imperative, that means it has to be. It's of vital, vital importance. It's of all importance. If you do not get that one settled, there is no hope. Right. And if there is no hope, there will be no help. And the other two are for help. This one's all for hope. If we do not understand who God is, who Christ is, then there is no hope. It's imperative. God's people have went after idols. And we find that in chapter 2. In chapter 2, we find that God's people have went after idols. We dealt with this the other day. In uh, verses 8 and 9, I believe it is. The land also is full of idols. And they worship the work of their own hands that which their own fingers are made. And the mean men bow down and the great men humble themselves. He said, listen, you've gone after idols. Went after the soothsayers, he tells them in, in verse number uh, uh, 6 of chapter 2. I mean, they went after the world's religion. They worship like the world. And they made things of their own hands to worship. They cut down a tree, tells us in Jeremiah. And they framed that tree. And, and what happens? They sit there and bow down to a stop. And what they didn't bow down to, they burned the fire to cook. What about that? They built it and they burned it. And it was all the same tree. Tree wasn't good for nothing. Now don't tell me it's a Christmas tree. They don't cut that, they don't they don't carve out Christmas trees. They cut down Christmas trees. And Christmas hadn't even come into existence at that point in time. Because Christ, that, that, that's you know that's over in Matthew. That's over in the New Testament of the Bible. When Jesus was born. And I'm not preaching for or against Christmas trees. I'm just trying to tell you. They make them totem poles. They make themselves idols. They make themselves Dagon. Oh, they're, and they've gone away after the ways of the world, after the world's religion and worship. And these were God's people. These were God's elect people. These were God's elite people. And that's where they went. Can I say, don't think it cannot happen to you. The works of your hands. Look at what I've accomplished. Look at what I've done. That's right. Oh, uh, look at my degrees on my wall. I'm an educated Baptist preacher. Mm -hmm. Look at my library. I've attained all these books. I haven't read none of them, but I've attained a bunch of them. <laughs> attained or obtained or something like that. I mean, I'm just trying to tell you, and I, and I like books. And I'm reading books. i am always got books that I'm reading. Some of them are online, some of them are... And I, I like reading. I believe you ought to read if you're going to leave. Mm -hmm. But I say this, it's imperative that you understand that He's it. See, these people, they, they've gone away backwards. They had gone away backwards and left their first love. They left God. I mean, chapter 40, 
I believe it is in verse number 18. He says, To whom will you like will, will you like in God? Or what likeness will you compare unto him? The workman melted the graven image, and the goldsmith spread it over with gold and cast a silver chain. He that is, is so impoverished that he had no oblation, choose a tree that will not rot. He seeketh unto him a cunning workman to prepare a graven image that shall not be moved. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the world or of the earth? It is he that sits upon a circle of the earth. I mean, not, not those images. That's right. Do you not even understand? I, even I, am he. It's imperative. If you do not understand that he's everything, He's the one who is all together lovely. He's the only hope we have. Our faith is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. That's right. Chapter 41 and verse 28. He says, For I beheld and there was no man, even among them, and there was no counselor that when I asked of them could answer a word. Behold, they're all vanity. Their works are nothing. Their molten images are wind and confusion. But I understand that I am He. I am He. Before me there was no God formed. Neither shall there be after me. He's the first and the last, the beginning and the ending. Matter of fact, verse number 13, I am He. Or, yea, before the day was, I am He. And there was none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work and who shall let it? He's the first and the last. He's the one who has done all of these things. By Him, all things consist. You know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and life was the light again. And the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it all. We know there was a man sent from God, his name was John, the same came for a witness, bear witness of the light. But we know, one, but we can go through all of what John did, he came to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. What would they believe? That he that was in the world, and the world was made by him, but they knew him not. They did not understand that he was God. But he was seated in the bosom of the Father at the same time he was walking in his world. Thank God. He had the spirit without measure. By him all things consist. By him all things were created because he's a sovereign creator. Matter of fact, he tells us. Huh? He says, But now thus saith the Lord that created thee. He's the creator. But not only is he the creator, but he's the Sorry, he's the soft creator, but he's the saving Christ. To look at verse number 11, I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. They went looking at everything else, the works of their hand, the wonders of idolatry, the world religions, and they found out it doesn't work. All's vanity! But can I tell you, when you come back to the fact that Jehovah God, oh God, behold God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid for the Lord. Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Chapter 12, verse number 2 tells us and we can now draw waters out of the wells of salvation according to verse number 3 of chapter 12. Why? Because there's no other Savior other than when God was manifest in the flesh. In the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is. And if you don't get that imperative right, the others don't matter. Because all our hope is based on the fact that He is God. And beside Him, there is none else. Right. Beside Him, 
there is no Savior. But there's a not just an imperative, an imperative, but we and uh, but there's an important thing. Not only do we understand that He is who He says He is, so that He can do what He says He can do, but but that we believe the promises of His Word. Not believe in Him, but believe Him. What He says, go. Can I say the second step in the Christian life is not just understanding who He is and just bowing down and believe, saying, I believe God is God, Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and I will trust Him. But there's the next thing, if you want to walk with God, you're going to have to start believing this, right? And can I say there's a problem today? Because most people want to believe in Him, but won't, don't want to believe. In the church, as I'm talking about. Can He take care of me? Will He walk with me? Will He talk with me? Can I? I mean, where, they say, where's the God of Elijah? They didn't question, where's the Elijah of God? Where's somebody who's going to say, I'm just going to take God and His Word and do all of His work by His Word and let His Word be a lamp in our feet and a light in our path. I want to trust and obey because there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. Right? Trust and obey. No matter what you're going through, He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee according to Hebrews 13 verses 5 and 6. It's a promise. He tells us in chapter 43 in our sports scripture, when that, in verse number 2, when thou passest through the water, guess what he says? I'll be with thee. I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. I mean, he told them, he says, listen, it's not going to get so deep that you can't, that you're going to drown. You say, why is that? Because your head's above water. He's seated in heavenly places. We're there in Him. Our head is Christ. Hallelujah. And I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The waters can't overflow us. Right, right. So it's easy to say. Sometimes I feel like I'm drowning in all my distress and in all my despair. I'm just going to give you a promise. Smoking flax, He will not quench. Oh, let me say this. A bruised reed, he will not quash. Or he will not break, is what the word says. I'll just give you a key word. Because it quash, quench. And he won't quit until he brings it on to victory. I am just trying to get you to understand that God is in charge. God is in control. Right. Amen. And we can rest in the truth that I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Say the fire is hot. Well, you'll not get burned. I remember reading about these three guys. Now, you might not have read the same books I read, but that means you haven't read through your Bible yet. It's only in the book of Daniel. You ain't even got through the Old Testament. But there's three boys. Grown boys. But they were boys. And, I, and, and when you're 56 years old, you start calling young men boys. You call teenagers and, and young 20s boys and stuff. All right? And, uh, but they, they were... They got out there and they, they were going to worship God and they wanted to love God and they were not going to do what they, they told them to do and bow before the, uh, when the sackbucks were sitting playing and all that stuff. You know what they said? We're going to cast you into the fire and furnace. But oh, maybe he looks down in that furnace. He did. <laughs> She's laughing at me. He looked down in that furnace. He said, I thought I threw three men in, but there was four men in, and the fourth one looks like the Son of God. That's right. He said, what happened? He said, I'll be with thee. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'll be there no matter what you're going through. It's not going to burn you. It'll burn the ropes. It'll burn everything, but it will not burn you. He said, why won't it burn you? Because our God's a consuming fire and He'll consume everything outside of His nature. But if you're walking in the Spirit, you'll not get burned because you're right. His nature. And fire does not burn fire. And so get on fire. Hallelujah. Let the fire of the Holy Ghost burn inside of you. And